Namaste. Welcome to another episode of Uladu Narpadu. Today we're going to talk about the right view of the jnani. If the ego, which is the embryo, comes into existence, everything, the world, God, bondage and liberation, knowledge and ignorance and so on, will come into existence. If the ego does not exist, everything will not exist. Hence, the ego itself is everything. Therefore, know that scrutinizing what is this ego is alone giving up or renouncing everything. <laughs> Normally, people think that we are in the world, but actually the jnani sees very clearly that the world is in us. So the whole world is a dream. And as soon as one looks into well, where does it come from? How does it arise? What is the seed? The whole thing unravels. It just evaporates, it disappears. And what's left is only consciousness and joy. Sat Chit Ananda. <laughs> I know this is hard to take, huh? Because it contradicts so many fixed beliefs that we have. Yet, if you go into it as a meditation, if you experience it for yourself, you'll find that it's true. But people are very afraid to look into the ego. Huh? They're very afraid. They, they, instead, they want to do years and years and years of sadhana. Huh? I love to tell this story. I know this guy from New York, a psychiatrist. He's a rather famous guy. He's got a couple of books out and this and that. Runs in the high society, Esalon crowd, you know. And... He's been going to Thailand every summer for a long time. One time he told me he's been to the rains meditation at a Buddhist monastery for 25 years, every summer. So I said, wow, you must be really enlightened. Huh? And he says, no, I'm still working through my childhood traumas. <laughs> The poor guy, he's totally hung up on his ego. So what to do? He's not hearing the Buddha's instructions saying that this whole thing doesn't exist. Huh? And he's certainly not working his way up the ladder of meditation to emptiness, nothingness. He's staying within the ego, why? Because he's afraid. And we are all afraid that if we dismantle the ego, everything will fall apart. And it will. <laughs> That's the thing, it will. But then we'll be in an ocean of delight, huh? swimming in an ocean of unlimited consciousness and bliss. <laughs> Try to understand. So, how do we approach this ego? Well, if we try to attack it directly and say, no, you don't exist. <laughs> of course, that just makes it stronger. Huh? So instead we attack indirectly by looking into how the ego arises. Where does it arise? How does it come into being? As in, we, we talked several times now about the mulapariyaya, the root sequence or root structure of the mind, and observing that in oneself. Not just talking about it like a philosophical argument, but actually going inside and watching it. As a fresh impression comes in through the senses, how we overlay it 
with this sense of mine. Uh, I'm looking out the window, I'm seeing the tree. Uh, this is my window. This is my tree. Uh, oh, it's not? <laughs> But we imagine it so. We think it so. Huh? My window, my tree, my clouds, my sky, my, my world. It goes to that ridiculous extreme. And it is so. Because as soon as that we designate something as mine, we have reinforced the idea of I. I exist as a separate individual, identified with this body and this mind. And then we go on to build all kinds of stories, huh? a whole soap opera <laughs> based on that. Here in India, the, the soap operas, they have a, a recurrent emotion or mood, which is the shock of finding out that one has been betrayed. Huh? Characters will go along, you know, and then something will happen, and they'll be shocked. <laughs> and the camera will zoom in on the face, you know, and just hold it for a while. I'm shocked. <laughs> shocked. <laughs> but that's how we feel when we discover the truth, that all this time we have been serving this imaginary God of I, the ego. Because along with the ego comes space, <clears throat> time, matter, energy, motion, work, uh, all the properties of physics, and then of course the human world with names and forms and different grades of persons who is on top who is on the bottom, whatever caste system we subscribe to, whether it's by birth or economic or, or uh, some social structure. And then it goes on. Huh? And there's always some drama, some conflict that keeps us engaged and keeps us in our role, whatever role we have chosen. Now, the one way to look at these things is that it's all karma. It's all coming from our previous birth activities. And another way to look at it is that it's just a choice. The being is always free. But we choose a certain lifestyle, a certain even a certain family to take birth in based on our own memories of what we did in the previous lives. It's not that there's some angel up there with a book recording everything and determining what the karma will be. No, we ourselves determine what the karma will be. Because we alone remember what we did. Now, there's no need for external bookkeeping agency. <laughs> what a ridiculous idea. Or an Akashic Records, huh? The Akashic Records is in your own mind. We bring the seed of the next body with us in the Manomaya Kosha when we leave this body, this Anamaya Kosha. We go to the next body. We don't really change bodies. We keep most of it with us. The Manomaya Kosha, the Vijnanamaya Kosha, the Anandamaya Kosha, the Pranamaya Kosha. We take them with us when we go to the next body. Only the Anamaya Kosha, this, this meat bag here, <laughs> is dropped. So try to understand what's going on. We bring our whole history with us. We bring our whole concept of existence with us into the next life and use that to construct a new body and take on another false identity, another false ego. And with that, the whole world springs into being. Try to understand our power. See, right now, 
most of you are living in a reality where you have a very limited fixed range of power and options and choice. And so what do you do? You uh, look at life from this viewpoint and then you go through so much sadhana and self-analysis and different kinds of struggles and so on to try to break out of it and attain realization. But who put you in that situation in the first place? You did. So from the point of view of a realized being, it's just ridiculous. Uh, it's laughable. It's ludicrous. Because we ourselves put ourselves in this situation, although we're actually free at all times. Why? Because we are trying to preserve the myth of the ego. The myth of the individual self. But there is no individual self. It's like, <laughs> it's like the, the bubble of foam in the surf at the beach saying, I'm going to remain a bubble of foam forever. I don't care what happens. Even if another wave breaks and, and smashes me to nothing and I merge back into the ocean, I'm going to come out again as another one, another bubble. So, and then we have all these bubbles fighting each other. It's just ridiculous. When you see it from the height of self-realization, it's a comedy, it's a farce. Because it's all not true. Huh? The, the whole world, the material world, is built on a lie. That lie is the individual existence. There is no individual. There is only God. There is only Brahman. There is only pure consciousness, non-dual existence. But we invent duality, and then we customize it to meet the needs of our story. So really what we're committed to is our story. And to have our story, to have our little soap opera of being an individual, we're willing to sacrifice everything including our happiness, our well-being, and so on, just so we can be right. I don't think that's a good deal. So how do we get out of it? Well, yeah, we can play the game of doing sadhana and having a guru and going through the whole thing. And, and usually that's what's required. But in the end, we simply change our point of view from being a body stuck in this world uh, and being an ego stuck in this body to being free and just watching the whole thing as a play, as a comedy show. Uh, because it is. It's a bunch of free beings who have chained themselves into this bondage in the material world. And it's all self-created. So it's really, really a, a hoot. So look at it this way. If you want to be free from your suffering, you have to be free from your ego. Then, like, who suffers? There isn't anybody to suffer. Objectless, pure, non-dual awareness certainly doesn't suffer. <laughs> so... Who are you going to call, you know? You are it. You decide. Do you want to suffer? Do you want to be free? Do you want to be a tiny, limited ego in a world of lies? Uh, false promises? Maya? Or do you want to be a, a free spirit? A completely unbounded consciousness in a world of bliss? It's up to you. Om Tat Sat. <laughs> Nothing but the truth here, folks. <laughs> Om Hari Om.